in his school of the to the Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, as well as to our Siddha Prabhupada, to the Bhakti Siddhanta Swami Maharaj, because his connection with the English speaking world was already set into motion when Srila Prabhupada Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati uh, requested him also to preach in the Western countries. So he considered that this service to help the devotees coming from the Western countries was his direct service to Srila Prabhupada. And one interesting thing is that during that time period, he spoke such an amazing Harikatha that even Srila Bhakti Pramod Puri Maharaj, upon reading the books that had been produced from his Harikatha, he said, actually Srila Sridhar Maharaj never even gave such things in the Bengali language, what he gave in English language. So those recordings, as I mentioned, there are about 1,200 hours of this recorded darshan. Many books have been produced from them. And in the past, uh, what is it, 22 years now, since his departure, uh, his books have been translated into numerous languages all throughout the world. And as I travel, I've had the experience that there are many, many devotees who never had this personal association, but through his uh, transcendental body, his words, they come to accept him very deeply in their heart as their Sikha Guru. So, in this way, we understand, as Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur said, uh, that he reasons ill who says that Vaishnavas die when thou art living still in sound. Uh, the Vaishnavas die to live and really try to spread the holy name around. So this is the nature of the pure Vaishnava. He is eternally present within his words, within his body. So this evening, just to start out our program, before I call on any devotees to speak, I want to read a few words from Srila Sridhar Maharaj so you can hear how he would uh, explain this beautiful Siddhanta. And I selected one little part. Actually, you can open up his books anywhere and begin reading. It's so uh, self-contained, all of his, all of his thoughts. But there's one section that I particularly, and I know that many devotees felt so much inspiration by, by hearing. And that was his description of the environment. So what is the environment? The environment means what is our current situation in our life. In other words, Every one of us Jesus souls have gone through many lifetimes in this material world. And we have created so many karmic deeds, uh, some good, some bad, like this. And what our current situation is, in other words, where we take our birth, what situation, uh, the enjoyment, the sufferings, etc., that are coming to us, these are by our previous life karma. So, Shilashina Maharaj, he very wonderfully explained that the environment that we are in is created by ourselves. And in actuality, if we are in the mood of trying to surrender to Sri Krishna in our life, and accept the shelter of his lotus feet as he states in Bhagavad Gita, Sankha Dharma, but it gets your mommy from Sankha Then, if we are in that mood, the environment is actually dealt with directly by Krishna himself. Therefore, Srila Siddhartha has explained that actually the environment is always friendly and is always favorable, even though it may appear that so many obstacles are coming. So this is a very broad topic, 
which you will see that I spoke of many, many times in such wonderful ways, and I just wanted to read a few of his words before I begin to call on the illustrious speakers this evening. He says, Our inner wealth can be discovered only by the help of Sadhu, Guru, and Scripture. Our vision should be that it is all nectar, but we have drawn a screen between the nectar and ourselves, and we are tasting the poison, thinking that it is very useful. On the whole, we must think that no blame is to be put on others. And it is actually the truth. We are responsible for our disgrace, for our fallen condition. And the path to self-improvement is also similar. We must learn to critique ourselves and to appreciate the environment. Our appreciation should especially be for Krishna and his devotees, and then gradually for everyone else. He has not given anyone the authority to harm us. Again, he being Krishna, he has not given anyone the authority to harm us. It appears that way, that it is only superficial and misleading. That anyone can do harm to anyone else is misleading. It is only true on the superficial plane. Of course, this does not condone harming others or ignoring oppression. But from the absolute standpoint, there is no harm. When we reach the highest stage of devotion, we shall see that everything is friendly and that our apprehension was wrong. It was a misconception. Misconception. Maya means that which is not. When everything is measured from the standpoint of selfishness and not from the universal interest, then that is the cause of all our troubles. We must gradually realize that why angle of vision was guided by selfish and not absolute consideration. So, I am suffering, but now I have come to understand that my interest is included in the absolute interest. To parody an old saying, a bad workman quarrels with his stools. Let me explain this. <laughs> you know, there's a saying that a person, like a worker, he has tools that he works with, hammer, saw, like this. So, you know, there's a saying that if a person is a bad worker, then he'll quarrel with his tools. Meaning, for example, if he's pounding a nail with a hammer, right? He's pounding the nail. And then suddenly, he mistakenly hits his finger with the hammer. And then he becomes angry at the hammer, throws the hammer down. So that's called quarreling with his tools. <laughs> so she was here for us. Uh, he modified this by saying that a bad workman quarrels with his stools. Now, how is that? How do we understand this? He explains, according to our karma, we produce the environment. Again, according to our karma, we produce the environment. What I am blaming was produced by my own karma. When I take food, then the stool comes as a natural reaction. 
direction. <laughs> it would be foolish to blame the stool for appearing. It is the effect of my having eaten. In the same way, I have acted in different ways, and the karmic result is my present environment. So, to quarrel with the reaction to our own misdeeds is a useless waste of energy. So the advice of the Srimad Bhagavatam should be our guiding principle under all circumstances. Whatever is coming to us is under His sanction, under His eye. So it cannot but be good. Everything is perfect. The only perfection is within us. And therefore we should try with all our energy to do our duty. In no time we shall find ourselves released from all troubles. That is the key advice of the Srimad Bhagavatam. The environment is not dead. An overseer is there. Just as the sun is over our heads, every action is under our guardian's eye. This comparison is given in the Rig Veda. Om Tat Vishnu Paramam Padam Sadat Parishanti Surya the Vibhachan Sharapatam. That we should approach any duty thinking, my guardian's eye is always vigilantly watching over me, seeing everything I am doing and whatever is happening to me. I need not worry about this environment or circumstance. So the Srimad Bhagavatam is saying, do, don't worry about the environment. Do your duty. Concentrate fully on what you are doing and then in no time you'll be relieved of the black box of the ego and will join in the universal flow of dancing, chanting, singing, and rejoicing. You will gain entrance into the lila or pastimes of the Lord. So in this way, Srila Siddhar Maharaj, he gives us relief. As the Srila Bhagavatam also tells us, Satayu Kamparam Sizani Shamaro Vundana Eva Kritam Vipata. He's actually explaining that verse. But in this way, Srila Siddhar Maharaj gives so much inspiration that we have to learn how to surrender at every moment to embrace the environment. And actually, this is the main principle of Sharanayati. It's called Gokritve Varana. Gokritve means that Krishna is our Gokta. Krishna is controlling everything. He is our guardian, as he told. His vigilant eye is always watching over us. To have that confidence, that I am fully maintained by Krishna at every moment. No one can harm me if it is not Krishna's will. And Krishna's will is all good, all perfect, and all protective over me. Therefore, I am surrendering. I am not blaming anything in the environment. I am accepting everything. In this way, as Srila Sridhar also wrote in another book, he said this is called Prakhanta Jivanam Rita. That means the nectar, the amrita, which is tasted by those who are surrendered souls, prakanda. So in their life, when they live in this surrendered way, at every moment, they are tasting nectar. So just a little excerpt like this from Srila Bhakti from Sridhar Maharaj. And now I want to call on some of the vice lovers present here. And the first person is uh, Shripad Bhaktivedanta Siddhartha Maharaj, who has a very great taste and attraction to the teachings of Shiva Bhakti Raksha Siddhartha Maharaj. <laughs> 
But 
but they kind of translate it too. So many, many coaches, you know, especially in America, um, the land of the free, because in France they were very, very oppressive, you no know, controlling, you no know, leader, and there was no news. All of this news and you know, knowledge was completely boycotted. But I was in America, and I was confronted with so many papers coming. And one of the leaders, you know, he has said this word already, you know, he confided to me that actually Shiva Prabhupada never appointed us as guru. So I thought, oh, then I'm going to see that person that Prabhupada said is you know, a pure devotee, and you know, Shiva Prabhupada and Krishna wanted him to prepare. So I decided to go back to France and make a revolution by telling all my god brothers actually Prabhupada never appointed those guys as heroes, so we should do something about it. And when I came to France, after two days, I received a copy of Sri Guru and His Grace, a book, a collection of, no, uh, explanation of Sri Ramana on the topic of Guru Tattva. When I read that book, I was convinced, I'm going all of this time, I'm going to go down. And that very year, 1985, when I moved back to France, I met Shri Govari Ramana. I heard him speaking for 10 minutes. And that's the only reason why I remained in this town. Otherwise, I would, be, I would have become a street writer. Oh. I would have become a follower of Shri Ramana. That's one of my greatest regrets in my life. That I could not meet him and associate with him personally. But I must say that along with Shri Ramana, in the March, I see Shri I hold Shri Ramana as one of the most profound influences of my life. I can say he has molded and shaped so much of my thinking. I have studied this book again and again and again, and some people who had complained that most of my Halikata as a traveling sannyasi is based on Shri Shira Maharaj, more than Shira Gurudev. Actually, I can say half of it, what I speak is from Shri Shira Maharaj, half is from Shri Gurudev Maharaj. When we came up on contact with Shri Shira Maharaj, actually, in that very morning, it was the end of his life. So we met a pure Vaishnava in a ripened stage of his full self-realization after a lifelong of service and meditation and absorption in the Krishna, pure Krishna consciousness. So what there was coming from his food was the fruit of very mature contemplation and realization. If you study his books, you will see with amazement there is not one aspect of, Shri, of Krishna consciousness Shri Ashutamana has, has not expanded upon with great detail and the most amazing insights. I turn to his books personally all the time as a great source of inspiration because you name it, take anything, he is giving the most thought-provoking insights to the Krishna consciousness that you can ever find. Maharaj Padmanabhar this morning was explaining how now Oshina Prabhupada was dealing with us, raw material, primitive devotees who didn't know our left hand or right hand in Krishna consciousness. We didn't know anything. Personally, I was in India before the Krishna Gauri. I was in Jagadapuri chanting Hare Krishna, initiated in the Shanga Sampadaya as a Mayavadi. Who was Krishna? No idea. I was chanting his name every day in Bhajan. No idea who was Krishna, who was Jagannath, who was Mahaprabhu, one of my greatest chains. So, nobody knew what Krishna in the world. Even those hippies or you know, students going to India didn't understand anything about Krishna. It's just one more of the gods playing the flute, this beautiful girl next to him, and he likes the cows. And this is what we knew about Krishna. But Prabhupada came and told us from A to Z. All, all, all basics. As far as true life he said this morning, he established some love again in such an amazing way. And Shri Ramakrishna on that platform, he went into all the details with the most amazing ways of presenting things. His mastery of the English language was perfect. So he was coming with phrases. He coined the phrases which are become like catch phrases. This morning we heard from Prajapana, another devotee, that 
that friends of the coming will die to live, for instance, taken from the German philosopher Inger, you have to die to live. Shira Shidomarch was explaining, we are making so much of the external, no, the environment of material nature and environment around us is not the covering. But we are so attached to the covering and we do not dive deep. Another of this catchphrase he said, you have to dive deep into the substance, but you're making so much of the covering. The covering is like the fruit deal. It is covering the fruit and protecting the fruit. But you are so attached to the covering, you're neglecting the inner substance. And he was explaining, you have to die to live. Explaining, Marsh has mentioned that in that book, the false ego is like a black box. You know when the plane crashes, they're trying to look for the black box because it contains all the information about the flight. So he says, the false ego is like a black box. It contains all the history of exploiting tendencies into what they call the world of exploitation versus the world of dedication and the spiritual world. He says this black box has to be totally dissolved. And he was explaining how in this world everyone is trying to live without death, without dying, which is not possible. You are confounded to death. This is called religion Loka, the world of death. Now he was saying that in the same way we should not try to live in the spirit world without first dying to all false people. He said you have to die. In the meaning, in the sense that you have to give up this exploiting tendency. We are thinking due to false ego, by being master, I am thriving, I am living. But actually, by being master, we are going down. So that tendency has to be killed. That's what you call dying. You have to die to yourself. The old self, the old man has to go, and a new self will come out. He said, we have to go and do that. This is one of the uh, proposal of catchphrase it was given like a mantra uh, to meditate upon it to go deep inside. Instead of what saying that oh I was proposed to become a charia, this is not my nature. I like to be in a small group of devotees, take one verse and consider it from different angles and go deep into it. And for a greatest good fortune, all the books of Shiva which have been compiled from this lecture, they are the right you know, maturation of all these, taking one verse and diving so deep into it and explaining it to us. Like taking it and showing us, oh, this is one jewel and this is another jewel and another jewel, like that, putting so many jewels from one verse. He had phrases which were so amazing, like uh, challenging. He was explaining, for instance, that the currency to enter into the spiritual world, the currency to trade in the spiritual world, is Shraddha, faith. And he said, faith is the halo of Shrimati Radharani. Now try to think about that. What maturation, what meditation must have been in which depth to come to that conclusion? Faith is a halo of Shrimati Radhika. Now just to think about it, maybe your head will start to hey, Faith is a what does that mean? And not only one phrase, but so many yeah, so many phrases like that. No. He explained that the old scriptures, for instance, they present God as the supreme personality of God. The stress is a shaya aspect, it's majestic aspect. But the Shema Bhagavatam is taking the absolute to the position of power to the position of love. And he explained that love is about power. Love is about power. And he dedicated two books on that subject of love. One is called The Golden Volcano of Divine Love. Speaking about Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his teaching and his life. And the other one is Loving Search for the Lord's Servant. No. How Krishna himself is engaged in a search for all us wayward servants who have fallen away. And if he was not looking after us, we would be completely hopeless. Or hope is that he is engaged himself 
in the loving search for us this foreign service. But all those conceptions we never heard before. And just to think just one title is enough to put you no, to give you food for the whole day to run on it and to make that upon it. He spoke of such and some guy in the most amazing way. He was explaining how in this world we have no position. We have no tangible position until we meet a genuine devotee. He was saying that until we get a connection with a real devotee, we have the ball being kicked around. We are thinking, I am going to do I am going to do that, I am great, I am big. Everyone is trying to be big, but he said, actually real bigness is not on that side. Real bigness is when you realize, I am nothing in front of the absolute. That is real bigness. And only the sadhu can establish you that consciousness. When you have such a connection, tangible connection, then you have a tangible position. He said, otherwise, from that standpoint, even your Brahma himself has no position. And he says, he's quoting the Srimad uh, Bhagavatam, when Brahma came to Dwaraka, Krishna asked, which Brahma? Which Brahma? Even Brahma could have such a tangible position without connection with the pure devotee. And he said, those pure devotees, they are like majors. He said, all conditioned souls, we are like minors. No. We are property. We are the rich son of the most great person. But we are minor and if somebody else is managing your estate, that person is a false ego. He's supposed to manage on our behalf, but he's cheating and we're being deprived. But the Vaishnavas, they like majors. They like guardians. They're warning us, hey, your manager is cheating you. So, he was explaining in such an amazing way, I mean, the words are jumping out of my mouth. He was explaining some other very powerful concept, concept that everything is floating in the ocean of consciousness. Now, everything is floating in the ocean of consciousness. What does that mean? Everything is conscious, but actually, we, it is only due to consciousness that we can perceive anything. Take consciousness away, zero, nothing. Everything we can think of, we can think of it only in terms of consciousness in the background. And he wrote this amazing book on you know, subjective evolution of consciousness. But taking us from the lower conceptions of Godhead to the highest. He was also very rusty. Very, very rusty. No, before him, no one had ever heard about Arabat Hassan. He is the first person to introduce this conception to the Western mind. That the service of Shimati Adhika is the highest thing. Or Shira Prabhupada never mentioned this in any lecture. That ultimately we must be the planet that is the main servant of Shira. Shimati Adhika. But Shira Shira Maharaj, back in the 1980s, early 1980s, he was thinking this, Radha Pasha is the highest thing, this is our ultimate goal. And who else but him could have extracted from the Brahma Gayatri the understanding that actually he refers to Radha Pasha. Ask anyone in India, ask any devotee, what is Brahma Gayatri? Oh, it refers to the Sangha, to Paramatma, to Narayan. But Shri Sridhar Maharaj, what did he do? He went directly inside the verse in deep samadhi meditation and he took out from that verse the meaning actually Bhargo Bhagavasya in this means the divine energy of the Lord it cannot be but his own Tavaka Shakti, his eternal energy this verse is meditation on no else than Shimati Radhika now who else could have presented such a thing so to uh, belong to the line of Thoth Shikamara, this is such a great honor. Or leaders made it like a stain of your Shrivara. But actually, when you read this book, you want to be Dr. Shrivara. And we feel so proud, so indebted to Shikamara, because the nectar flowing from his books is simply amazing. You can just pick up the book. A book, you cannot put it down because it is pregnant with so much meaning, so much explanation of Christian consciousness. It can take you so much deep, deeper than you ever thought, just by reading superficially. Or Shiva Prabhupada was saying that 
What should not think that I can get everything from just by reading books. I must approach the same. No. You must go and study the same book at the feet of the same. So she has seen the marsh, he digested through his own life, all the shastras, and rendered this a meditation of a whole life into those amazing speeches which were recorded. When you hear his voice, the one who's approaching as said before, as he was very old, you have this amazing person speaking with a deeper civilization in a very soft, unassuming, but at the same time so powerful voice and presenting the most lofty conception of Krishna consciousness and taking them and making them very clear, very easy to digest to this amazing audience. So I am very happy to be able to be given a chance today to glorify Shri Shri and I pray that verse after verse I'll be able to address the station of Vaishnava for that caliber. Thank you very much. 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 Thank here, who also had the association of Sri Vasudhar Maharaj. Um, and I want to call on a couple of these devotees first uh, before I call on the prominent, the main speakers. So, one devotee is Sri Vasudhar Chaitanya Chandra Prabhu, so he'll come and speak for a few short minutes. And he 
said to the person who used this to go out and preach, he explained how he used to travel just like a very hard with the brahmacharis that get in the train and go all over India and South India. And they go to a village, he said, and one man would have a big drum like a bass drum in a circus, and they go to the village and beat the drum. And then uh, they attract a crowd, and it was this job to step forward and speak and attract a few people, and they try and locate who was the Durham Warrior in, in the town. And then that person would uh, arrange one program for them and make a punch out and they would preach there.
things for yourself. You pray for head to look more too many. But one of the most astonishing things that I've heard him say, which I'll never forget, one day he was very great, he told the story of, uh, he mentioned the departure of his own father. His father passed away when he was a young man after he joined the mother. And she was very much able to realize that coming from a very high quality of family, they were testing him a little bit of a story. Sorry about Brahminas from uh, South India for many generations, and they settled in Bengal sometime before then. And they were very strict smarters and followed all the regulations and had such a high possible position. But uh, after some time, he joined the uh, month of uh, Gaudiya month and the Silver Cup in the Soviet Cup, and he explained that uh, his own father, he said he hated the party of Mahatma Within his own family, he uh, started putting stand the, in his eyes, contentious uh, anti social methods of the Gaudiya's. Uh, and uh, he tried many times to uh, influence him away from the month, but he couldn't do that. Finally, it was the time when his own father was leaving this world. And uh, Shula Shira actually called him to the, to the family home, and he went to see his father on his deathbed. And when he said there was tears in his eyes, it was very great. And he just explained that um, my own father, he begged me to get off this party with my mother. He said that uh, on my dying wish, please just give up his philosophy and return to your family tradition and said to come back to the family. And uh, he said, to my own father, he's dying which I could not abide because I could not give up my attachment to my children of old father, to the Baptist Minister of the entire world. Now for a person like that, we know how strict Indian culture is, and such a high class personality, to make such a sacrifice for the sake of their Guru Guru Bhagra and their Jaga Guru Shiva Bhagra. We cannot estimate the level of dedication, the high caliber of the devotees. And we only pray on this day for them to show the mercy of what it is. That we can always remember them constantly and be suffer our engage in their service and the service of their territories and the service of God in this world and by trust. I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much for your patience. Excuse me.